Jamie Bolsh, Olympic medalist. How are you? <laughs> I'm all good. I'm all good. It's good to uh, be on the show. I know. It's only taken about fucking five months. <laughs> <laughs> no. Thank you for thank you for joining me. Um, how's things? All good, man. Yeah, li- life's good. Um, pretty busy at the moment, but um, yeah, it's taken a while for us to get this uh, sorted. And I mean, my diary, your diary, mm. fitting it all in. Oh, I can do next week. Oh, no, I can't. Something else is coming. Yeah, so... <laughs> Always uh, happens. Yeah, but we're, we're here now. Finally, yeah. And it was the one that we actually not planned. It was like kind of <laughs> short notice more, which worked well. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I want to, as I do with all my guests, I like to, you know, obviously get a feel of, like, you know, how their upbringing was and so mm. on. So you actually were born in Nottingham, is not, that right? Yeah. That's, yeah, yeah, Nottingham. I was... Um, so I'm adopted. Yeah. Um, I was born in Nottingham. So uh, for my sins, I'm English. Um, um, <laughs> but I've got red blood. So um, I'm definitely Welsh. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and the accents just come yeah, through. Exactly. The Newport accent is there. I, um, so, yeah, I was, I was born in Nottingham. And uh, I moved literally to uh, Newport in South Wales when I was six months old. So my mum and dad, Marilyn and Alan, Went up to Nottingham um, and picked me up, and the rest is history. And I, it's funny; I always say to my my mum and my dad, I said, "Oh, you know, you know, when you adopted me, was it, is it like a like a dog's kennel sort of <laughs> thing? You know, like a dog's home where you know it's all these babies like in a line, and it, you just go down pick the line one, and yeah. pick one." I said, "Was it like that?" He said, "Well, my dad always says this. He says, Jane, he said, um, well, if that was the case, we definitely wouldn't have picked you because you weren't the, <laughs> you weren't the best looking kid as a child." <laughs> You always think it's a bit <laughs> So, uh, but so six months are so very early then. Mm, yeah, yeah, which is a good thing. Yeah, so it's you know I've got no sort of memories or anything like that of being there, of being in like, like the home I was at. at. Um, so yeah, my mum and dad sort of nurtured me from there on in, and it's it's mad because I've got two sisters and one brother. My my oldest, my brother's the oldest, and he was from my. Uh, the parent, my mum and dad, who've raised me, and then um, my mum was told she never could never have children again, so they adopted Sarah. Oh wow! And then my mum got pregnant again with Lucy, um, uh, and that were meant to happen. And then they adopted me, so I'm like the little rent of the family. Yeah, yeah so I'm the baby of the so family. That, oh my god, they must be amazing people to yeah. obviously adopt and things like that. Well, yeah, you know, you know what's amazing about them. You know, I'm mixed race and. My my parents are white, and you know to you know I they they brought me to Wales in the seventies. You know, Wales now is a lot more cosmopolitan. You mm. know, it's a lot you know it's it's a lot more out there. You know, but to have a mixed race kid in the seventies and they're white, gr- gr- growing up in a small village in Hentless in Cumbran, um, you know, I was the only mixed race kid in the village. Um, the only gay in the village. Yeah, yeah, the only, I, was yeah, that, yeah. I, was <laughs> I was the only mixed race kid, you know, in the village. And for them to have done that, you know, I think that's testimony of how amazing they are because they didn't have to. And um, yeah, amazing people. Do, have they have they actually told you any stories or kind of, you know, did they go through any shit themselves? You know, in terms of you know raci- racially abused or anything yeah, like that. Yeah, you know what. I, they didn't surprisingly wow. yeah I know you know because I've asked my mum and dad this I said you must have you know when you were pushing me around the pram in Asda you must have <laughs> had a little bit of a and they said you know what we didn't really suffer Amazing. anything of that which is remarkable really which is nice you know I like I like. I know, we that. say that like it's, it's, oh, it's what like it's, taken back you should be fucking that it should that. be yeah. that it should yeah. be that but you know we it's it, it hasn't been but um and I, I think you know because I was brought up in this village like I said in Hentless in, uh, in Cumbran you know, it was a really cool village where you would leave your door open, you know, you wouldn't have to lock it. Mm. Everyone knew each other. The school I attended, Hentless Junior School, only had 35 kids attending yeah. it. You know, it was one of them was really small, small yeah. community and everyone had each other's back. Was, um, and yeah, so I was I was very lucky, very lucky. No, it's amazing. And, and You know, with in terms of being adopted, because your parents could have mm. basically said... You kept it going for a long time. At what age did they say to you, look, you, you've been adopted and, yeah. and so on? Because as you say, yeah. you're mixed race. So you're going to look at your parents seeing they're yeah, both go, white. Well, yeah, what's going on? Am I the milkman's son? I, yeah, you know? yeah, what's going on there? Like, do you know what I mean? I, um, basically, my mum is a retired school. Uh, she was a school teacher, obviously retired now. And she um, used to tell me stories when I was really, really young. Oh, no. Stories yeah. which I can't remember about me being adopted. So it was like a natural introduction. It was never a time where they sat me down when I was 10 years old and said, by the way, never had that conversation because I always knew I was adopted. 
I, you know, my, you know, me and my mother sort of spoken about it. I said, well, what did you do? Like, how did you mm. say it? And she said, no, I just used to introduce some in your bedtime stories and very clever. Yeah. Um. So I never, I never had that. But it's quite funny because my mum and dad clearly don't look like me. <laughs> um. But when I see, when I used to compete, like do the, the track and field, you know, I'd be at an event with my dad and people would come up. Oh, yeah, that's your dad. Yeah, I can see you've got the same nose. And you'd be like, <laughs> like stop lying. Really? Like, <laughs> really? Shit, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, do me a <laughs> bollocks. Like, and yeah. I'm thinking... You know, what are you on about? You know, but um, yeah, it was quite a funny, funny thing, really. But yeah, I, so I've always known I was adopted and I've I've always been cool with that. You know what I mean? That's good. Mm, mm. That's really good. Really so you cool. didn't have that kind of, did you ever find the, did you ever have that urge to find who your parents were and ask those questions? Yeah, so. Did you do a TV uh, series? Yeah, that's or, right, a TV yeah. show on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I did a documentary in 2014, 2015. Yeah. Um, and it was it was on um, BBC and it was um, Jamie Bolton's Search of His Birth Mother. Wow. And then a year later, I did one, Jamie Bolton's Search of His Birth Father. The first one won a BAFTA. You know, he was really? a, a, it was a, it's a really hard hitting documentary. So if anyone wants to watch, if you just go on jamiebolch.com, yeah, and then go on to the TV section. It it's a it's a good it's a good watch. It's a very hard watch. Yeah. It's a very honest watch. It's the camera's just turned on. There was no script. It was just let's see what comes. And what we managed to get was just some amazing footage. And uh, I did get to meet my birth mother. And um, wow, <laughs> that, how did that go? That, that that was kind of when you grow up, uh, you you. You know, I think a lot of adoptees will all say something similar. They, they, you've got this fantasy that your mother and father are going to be special people to a degree. You always hope that yeah. they will. And obviously they've adopted you for a reason. So there's going to be a bit of negativity there. But, you know, you always hope they will. And and I remember, you know, actually the day I met my mother and they, they, they had the cameras on me. And we I literally said, look, my mum's through that door the cameras aren't coming in on this part. You know, I was like, you know, this is between me and my mum. You know, yeah. I, I'm, I'm 40, you know, mid 40s, I want, I, I, or whatever it was. And I want to, um, I want to make sure that it's my time. So I remember walking into this room and I saw this lady, which was my mother, just sat there, like in a bent over, like looking like this. And I went, shit, that's my mum. Mm. Like, and I walked over to her and, she was sat down and I'm walking towards her and I thought, well, what do I say? What do I do? What do I introduce her? Like, hi, mum. Yeah. No, she's not my mum because my mum who's raised me is my mum. Yeah, yeah. all that. So it's suddenly all this conflict and weirdness goes in your head. So I, I literally rugby tackled her. <laughs> <laughs> like spear tackled her because I, I didn't know what to do. So yeah. she was sat down. So I gave her this big hug thing. And this is the bit which got to me. She said... Jamie, right? And she hugged me and she started crying. I burst out crying because my mother, Teresa, she, um, my, my adopted, uh, the, 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 my uh, natural mother then, she um, named me Jamie. Oh, wow. Yeah. And so, it stayed. And say, it yeah. stayed. So when she said, if she'd gone Steve, yeah. well, yeah. Like, what like, the what hell? The, what? No, my here? name's not Steve. You know, yeah. it would have been weird. But when she said Jamie, so for the first time, obviously, which I can remember, she's called me by my name and it, and it broke me. And, and uh, we both sort of cried, sobbed for a bit. But we, it was like a, a, a tears of sort of joy and relief. And it was, it was kind of a weird thing, actually, at the time. Even now trying to describe it here it was a weird thing, but it was a real lovely moment. And, I instantly, instantly had a connection, like, to her, um, which I found kind of bizarre, um, but amazing. Uh, to move on, my mum and dad, who've raised me, they were really accepting of me meeting her. They were all over the documentary yeah. and happy with it. It was no challenge for me whatsoever. Um, but to this day, my mum and dad, who've raised me and my parents... Because anyone can be a mother and a father, but not many people can. But not everyone can be a parent. Yeah, exactly. That's two yeah. massive things. And of course I, it is. And 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 my people, you know, um, who, who've like I said, have raised me, Marilyn and Alan. They are my parents, and I love them unconditionally. So they were very supportive. I think if they had said, "Oh, we don't really want you doing this," not I knew they would always let me do it. But if they said we don't, I would have not done it. But I knew they would be accepting. Yeah, accepting yeah. And in fact my mum said to me, you know, like I said, who raised me, she said, um, I'm surprised you've never really asked me before. 
And I was like, oh, I'd never thought of what it ma- What made you ask those questions? And, and Because, obviously, I'm not talking from experience here mm. because my parents are still mm. together, but, um, you know, you do see documentaries and do see other people who have been adopted and they can't have that bond with their parent. They ask a yeah. lot of questions. They hold a lot of hate there. Why yeah. did you do this to me? And why did you yeah. do that? Did you ask those questions of, you know, why? I, I, never, I never really did, which is kind of strange. It's kind of... Like a lot of adoptive uh, ad- adoptees have got a lot of anger issues. Yeah, They're quite angry people <laughs> just generally, and I'm t- I'm saying that as a general throwaway. Do you think thing. that like you know, um, because you were you know adopted so young mm. that you didn't have those emotions maybe of like build the build up like say if you're eight or nine going into a meet a duffel yeah. ball game? Yes, you know they say that you know the adopt you know people who were adopted early is far is a far better option for the child because yeah. it just means that emotion that that getting you know pulled from pillar to post and and, and that sort of thing so for me it was just a, f- a natural sort of environment as far as i was concerned uh, to go to go into so it was you know it was um i never really asked because i was i was very lucky because you know we'll talk about the running a bit later on but i'll just put on this bit because i had running to uh, to distract me. Yeah. I was so busy with my athletics and having such fun early on in my athletics right through to the end of my career. I didn't have time to mm. think. Yeah. I was never in one place for no long. And I, you know, and I think, you know, maybe if I, I, I weren't doing very well in school or I weren't really popular in school, but I was very well liked in school. I was quite a popular kid in school. I was, I, I weren't the best school kid. I, like I was, crap at my exams like, like, I was shit but you're just like the, probably like the funny kid I was or something. a funny yeah, the kid cool I was, kids, yeah, yeah you know the joker I don't I don't know what I was like for you but I was I was pretty much a bit of a joker in school but a popular yeah you know, I wasn't the disruptive naughty kid I was the funny comical kid I think who, I was probably quite similar yeah yeah yeah, yeah. I was going to say you most and because when you're good at sport you, it, I don't know about you but it feels like you can get away with a little I bit got more a, I got away with murder yeah I remember being in my junior school uh, which I only had thirty-five people in, like I said, and um, that's fucking nuts, by the way. <laughs> I know, no, it was like it was like, it's like in the middle of five, five, five per class. <laughs> I mean, like, fuck, you know, what's going on here? And and what I loved about it is, um, I remember I was about six years old, something like that, and I was bored and I was typical naughty like person, and I um I wrote bum on my book, right, B U M bum, right. Suddenly, one one of the teachers saw it and went. Jamie, that's a very naughty word. <laughs> you've, <laughs> you've got to go to the headmaster. So I'm walking up to the headmaster's room, almost proud, like walking through the class because I'm cheeky. I'm really cheeky. I, was, I, I really was cheeky as a kid. Like I said, not a horrible cheeky, this comical fun cheek. So I went into the uh, the headmaster's office, stood there like all like nervous and a bit sheepish. And he took the paper and he stared at it and he stared at me, stared at the paper and he said, well, at least you spelt it right. <laughs> <laughs> at least you don't say it right yeah. then. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and that was like, like you know my my life. Really. You used to get away with all yeah, sorts. Yeah, I used to get away with it. At mm. what age, when you were coming through, um, did you actually find athletics, or you found that you were kind of going into that kind of sport? So you were good at it, basically. Mm. And when you you know you had yeah. that kind of yeah. So I, it was it was when I was eleven. I remember it, like yesterday is um so i was good at all sport i, I was tracked there i was useless at football we'll chat about that yeah. later like i'm bad football yeah i'm good at rugby swimming tennis everything but football hey it's not as easy it's, as people th- think i know <laughs> I, was, I was very quick with the ball i'll have to tell you a football story later on because i've got a couple of football stories um and um in fact there's a few a few few sort of sporting things but um um so I was 11, and you know you have sports day in your school. Yeah. Um, so I was doing this event called the Obstacle Race, and it so happened that my headmaster, um, uh, the headmaster's changed over the years, and this new headmaster called Mr. Atkins was into athletics. And um, we had sports day, and this event, the Obstacle Race, would start off, you'd have to run 10 metres with an egg and spoon. Yeah. Then you'd go over a wooden bench when those wooden low yeah, little benches shit, then, hit, shit benches, you know what I mean? Then uh, you'd jump off that and then you'd get into this sack like that and bound in the sack and then you'd go underneath a crash mat and sprint to the finish. So the headmaster goes, on your marks, set, go. So I started running with the egg and spoon over the wooden bench into the sack like that underneath the crash mat because I couldn't see how I was going. It was dark under there. I ended up coming out of the side instead <laughs> of the end and uh, he said, Jamie, you've cheated. You've got to go back to the start. 
So I ran all the way back to the start, picked up the egg and spoon, uh, ran with the egg and spoon over the wooden bench, into the sack, underneath the craftsman, sprinted to the finish, and I won the race. Oh, wow. I went twice as fast as every kid in the whole school. And my headmaster okay, goes, hey, you're very quick. He said, I think you should join a running club, which is Newport yeah. Harriers. And I did that following Tuesday. I went down to Newport Harriers with my mum was the first person who ever took me, my granddad. And uh, the rest is history. Wow. And that's how I got into, that's how I that's got mad, into isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Just because of sports, say in school, running, took me, bang. That, you know, I like to go through the whole procession of did it. You enjoy, did you enjoy it? Did loved, you loved it? Loved it. Actually loved it. It's funny because when you get into that, what I deem to be a professional environment rather than it being a school, you know, there was all these kids um, who were athletes and some of them had been running for years yeah. so they had the technique and, you know, I weren't the fastest kid straight away. I was I was up there, you know, like in Gwent now, you're talking yeah. in the whole of the county. Um and I was, you know, I was like Lord Farquhar from Shrek, you know, <laughs> I'm like the shortest athlete out there. Like yeah. I'm only five foot eight now. And when I was like, you know, when I was a kid, I was really small. Do you know what I mean? And I would be racing kids like a foot taller than me and still beat them. So yeah. I, I loved that. It was like the David and Goliath story where I'd be like, oh, my God, I'm kicking these big people's butts. Like, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? and, I, and I think that gave me that you know, excitement to want to keep doing it. I loved beating people. You Which know? is not a bad thing to... Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was, it was great. It was a great, you know, those informative years were just really special to me, you know. And what, and what and when you went from like, obviously that, how quick did you, when you first went to the running club, did you, get, you know, kind of get noticed? Very quickly, within a month. Did you? Yeah, within wow. that first month, really. Like, I think that, you know, you had sports day in the summer, Later on that month, I won the Gwent Championship. Amazing. 100 metres, you know what I mean? So I went from being this kid who just did it in school to being the best in the county, you know? Yeah, because obviously people who are familiar with your career, they'd noticed that you're a 400 metre runner. But as you discussed before, you started off with 100 metres. Yeah, yeah. So it was it was weird. I, I So I started off with the, uh, the 100 and 200 metres. So from when I was 11 to when I was literally 20, what, 22 I ran the 100, wow. 200 meters and um, I did it. I came, you know, I, just to give you a little bit of a the background of, of, of the progress. So I went from county champion when I was 11, 12, 13, 14. And then I, I would always come about second or third in the Welsh championships. Yeah. I'd never win it. I only I won it when I was 15. And I, I'll tell you a story of it, actually, because it's, it's, it's quite good to show you the progression. So. You know, and you'll know this, you know, when you're in school and you're 11, 12, 13, 14, and you'd always have that kid who had the moustache yeah. and the beard. And and you'd be like, oh, he's in the same year as me. Same like, as me, yeah. To, you know, you'd, you'd have, you're a man. He's bought, developing quicker, yeah. yeah. Proper, you know, he'd, he'd be the one like stripping down, going, yeah, look at me in the shower, <laughs> you know, and you'd be like, you know. And um, so those type of people. Well, when I was 13, 12, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, I was not quite immature as a kid. I didn't develop as quick as some of the others. But as soon as I got to 15, I raced in Cumberland Stadium. I've got a really good photograph of it. And I won the Welsh Championships for the first time, 100 metres. And it's because my strength went up. Yeah. And they stayed the same. And those people never really progressed any further. And the, the only reason they were winning when they were winning is because they were more mature than the, mm. the than the talented ones. Yeah. You know, and they, you know, if any if they're listening to this now, <laughs> they're going to be like, well, hang on, you know. But it's the truth is they they just had more, you know, you know, they just had more sort of testosterone, I suppose, yeah. when they were they, when they were kids. So yeah, so I started off my career when it, running ones and twos, and. It, I'll, I'll tell you the story of what, what you know. So, 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 so then I, I ended up uh, winning the European champs in the relay when I was seventeen in the four by one. Came sixth in the European final. Darren Camp in the two hundred meters. Darren Campbell ended up winning it. To the following year in nineteen ninety two, going to Seoul, Korea, where they had the Olympics. Yeah. Ben Johnson, you know, in eighty eight Olympics. So I went ran there, and I ended up coming fourth in the two hundred meter final in the World Juniors. Uh, Atto Bolden, people will remember him, won it. Darren Campbell, the yeah. great uh, British uh, Manchester athlete but lives in Wales, come second. Some South African bloody beat me and I came fourth. But we ended up winning the uh, four by 100 metres and breaking the world junior record. Oh, wow. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. So so that's how I sort of, 
progressed through you know i was just training twice a week at first to then training three four times a week by the time i was like 18 and um yeah it was only when i, I it was it was it was a bit of a a random thing how i ended up moving up to 400 and you know i want to say this story because i think it's quite important you know it was a massive important thing to my career it was at 1994 commonwealth games in canada in Victoria, brilliant place. One of, if not my favourite competition I ever competed in because you're a kid. Yeah. Commonwealth Games, you're competing for Wales, the Red Vest. You know, we're all proud. Right? Yeah. You know, we all love the Red Vest, right? So I was loving it. Knew I weren't going to do anything crazy special because I was only like 21 when I was there. Um, and I was just coming from the juniors. Basically, at that competition, so just to give it a bit of a framework here, Colin Jackson... Mm had won the world championships in 93, the year before, and broke the world record yeah. in the 110 hurdle. Colin Jackson, Machine. everyone knows him, right? Yeah. I'm in his room with Paul Gray at the Commonwealth a year later, like I said, in 94 Commonwealth Games. So everyone knows Colin. Right? He's uber famous. And I'm <laughs> sat in the room with him and he goes, Jamie, I, I've, you know, cause he, I, he's, just to go back, Colin's known me since I started Athletics because we trained in Cumbran Stadium. Yeah. Not together, but he knew me. I saw him. He was the great Colin Jackson and he always used to see me. So he said to me, so I, so I knew him fairly well. So he said to me at the Commonwealth, uh, Jane, he said, how would you like me to be your coach? What? <laughs> what, what do you mean? Like, yeah, how would you like? He said, I've got a house in America, in Florida. Um, Linford Christie's got a house down the road. Mark McCoy's got a house down the road. You can train with me, Linford, Frankie Fredericks, uh, Merlin Otti, John Regis. I'm like, what? He said, and this is the bit, I'll pay for everything. What? <laughs> he said, yeah, uh, business class flights to Florida. Um, I'll pay for everything for you. Um, you haven't got to worry about any money. I can see you've got talent. Do you want me to be your coach? Fucking of course you yeah, do. Yeah. Who doesn't? Do you know yeah. what I mean? So I've, I phoned my dad from yeah. the Commonwealth Games, saying, "Dad, Dad, Colin's offered the coach. What do you think?" Like, you know, I knew he'd say, "Yeah," and I had a great coach at the time, a guy called Jim Anderson, jock. He's passed away now. God rest his soul. Christian Malcolm's coach, coached some great athletes, but this opportunity was just huge, and it was not to be missed. Um, so that was late '94. I ended up being on a plane, sat next to Colin flying to his house in Florida in Tampa, stayed there for three months, came home for about a week, went back there for another three months, six months training with these guys. That's 94, 95. Colin was coaching me for the 100 metres and 200 metres, ran a PB in 95 over um, the uh, 100 metres, ran 10.5. He coached me so hard... And I was in such a great environment. I was uber fit. I mean, I could have done. I could... What was his What was his coaching like? Because when you meet him, he's like literally the nicest guy on the planet. And when we, I had him on the show, yeah, he was. He's just so laid back. Yeah, I'm like thinking, fucking hell! Like you're obviously yeah. one of the greats who's ever done it, yeah. especially from our country. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just like looking at him, thinking, right, what what happened? Like, how did it? And he's like, oh, I just fell into it. This has happened. This yeah, that happened. Yeah. He's just so laid back about things. But what was he like as a coach? You say that he's pushed you hard. Was he intense? It, Colin's the devil. Like, like because Colin, you don't. Because that's what I was saying to him. You don't get to the level that he has unless you work Co fucking extremely no, hard. Colin, and if he was sat here now, he was the most evilest guy. Good. Like, let me let me give you framework on this. Colin's an amazing guy. Yeah. Colin's a really lovely guy. Let me just say that, right? Let me get that bit in first. He's like, yeah, he's one of the nicest guys oh, you can meet. Fucking hell, what a bastard. You know what I mean? Like, he <laughs> used to push me so hard where he'd be shouting at me. I'd be vomiting, get back up. Uh, uh, you know. But you need that, don't yeah, you? Yeah, I needed it. I needed it. And he knew I needed it. And I knew I needed it. And this is the other bit. Massive ingredients I missed out. But really, really uber important ingredient. I missed out, in, in, and I'll say it now. When he said, I'll be your coach, and I went to Florida, just before I left, my ex-partner, Susanna, said, I'm pregnant. I'm Fucking like, hell. what? She said, I'm pregnant. I went, don't be stupid, you know, thinking, yeah, yeah. I was 21. She said, uh, yeah, I am. I said, babe, I've got to go to, um, I've got to go to, 
Florida were calling. She said, no, 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 go. I'm not saying don't go, but I'm just telling you. So I got on the plane. I thought, do I tell Colin? Do you know what I mean? Do you know what yeah. I mean? I got to Florida and I said, oh, Col, you know, I was around the table with the other athletes. I said, Susanna's pregnant. And I, he went, don't be stupid. He goes, she's not. She's just disappointed you here. She's just upset, blah, blah, blah. I went, yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. <laughs> Came back three months later. She had a belly on her. I went, oh, shit. She's definitely not okay, lying now. She's not lying. Yeah. I went back to Florida. I said to them, look, she is pregnant. It was the Rocky story. When you're 21 years old and you're <laughs> up against the wall, you're backed against the wall and you think, am I going to work in McDonald's? for the rest of my life mm. not that I'd ever worked in McDonald's so I don't mean this in a bad way yeah, for whoever yeah. works in McDonald's or am I going to be the fastest athlete on the planet I had two choices I went either commit or don't yeah and then suffer because I haven't got the finance to help my son or uh, and my partner and whatnot so that train in that winter I mean I left no stone unturned. Do you know what I mean? Mm. I committed. I was sick. I was crying. I was upset. I was hurting. Lactic vomit. You know, missing family. You know, I I gave you having trained on Christmas Day. Do you know what? Like, that's where. Do you know when people? I'm sure you've probably had it as well in your career, and people still maybe say to you to this day, "Is that oh you had a lucky life or you were lucky," <laughs> and. It fucking infuriates my soul <laughs> just purely because the story that you're saying there where you've had to leave mm -hmm. your partner at the time yeah. she's pregnant you're grafting your balls off mm. day in day out you're mm. being sick blood sweat tears all of that whereas the people who say you're lucky are not doing that yeah so you're not lucky you I, fucking worked I, extremely I, hard exactly. to get to that level exactly well it's a story i'll bring up right now which which, which it just made me think of it so and you'll totally get this, you know, from being an elite sportsman yourself. Like, I remember I was about 15 years old, 15, 16, something like that. And Michael Jackson uh, was playing in Cardiff. Yeah. Everyone in my training group went to the concert but me. And I went to training that day. And nobody turned up. It was just me and my coach and my dad. And I trained that day. And I was, you can imagine, I was pissed off. Yeah, I was yeah. like going, oh, I want to be at the concert. I should have gone. I should have gone. And and but I, I I carried on training. I'm the only person in that group who's got an Olympic medal, and I think that sums up what it takes. Hundred percent. That's just a small story of commitment. When everyone else, you if you want to be the best in the world, it's something you got to you got to do stuff which other people aren't willing to do. Yeah. And I was willing to train on Christmas Day, miss the Michael Jackson concert, be sick every you know pretty much every day, miss my family, be in an environment. Yes, it was good. I'm not going to say it was all bad because it was an amazing environment I was in, but it was tough. It was tough sacrifice, I was, I, yeah. You know, you know, I miss my mum and dad. I, you know, and then when Jay, my oldest, who's 27 now, <laughs> when he was born. You know, I would go back to Florida and Australia, you know, months later. So he'd be three months. Yeah. I'd go to Australia, come back, and I'd go, well, who's this? That he had changed so much. I remember going away, and I would be crying, leaving the house, crying. And then when I saw my son, I would cry again because it was another kid. Another kid it was yeah. like somebody else's kid. You know what I mean? I was like, and they're informative years, you know. Mm. And luckily, me and Jay and Morgan, now my youngest, we've got a great relationship. But... But it was it hurt, you know. No, no, you know, people don't understand that suffering. How tough was that for you? Re really tough, you know. It's stuff which, you know, would I do it again? Yes. Did I like it? No. Did I really dislike it? Yeah. I, 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 I didn't like the fact of how hard it was. But if if you're to if you're if you're trying to be an Olympic medalist or win a world championships. You've got to do everything it takes to enable yourself or give you that chance. At yeah. least give yourself an opportunity. And, you know, when somebody like Colin is giving me, you know, the olive branch and has gone, I will give you this opportunity to be able to train, to be able to be in an elite environment. Now it's down to you to commit in that environment. Of course I'm going to take it. And Those opportunities don't come along yeah, every you know, day. No, not at all. And so Colin must have spent... 30, 40, 50k on me at least. Never asked for it back. Never like never. Ne we've we've talked about it, not about the money or anything, but we've talked about. I said, "Cole, man, so this you know it's you, right? You know I know yeah. my mum and dad took me 
did what they did and I call it the Christmas tree effect if you want to be the star on top of the Christmas tree you've got to you've got to have the great parents great yeah. coach great nutrition great environment great you know and Colin was a massive branch of that tree and I mean you know that opportunity he'd, he'd never really offered it really to anyone else um, of, of, of my caliber you know from a you know people like Paul Gray Sally Ann Short went to a local Welsh athletes but those athletes i trained with him all the way through mm. i was a new kid so he's like your angel yeah yeah angel investor yeah i've never really he was like he was my angel yeah. and my angel investor who basically came into my life at the right time and what that was that was 94 going into the winter for 95 96 i got an olympic silver medal you That's, know do you think that you know you having that medal and things like that how obviously you said based on you know you said it's Obviously, it's down to you, but it's then mm. having the opportunities. How important was it, someone to have someone of that caliber mm. believe in you at that precise oh, moment? Massive, because I'd just come out of the juniors and I I, I went into the senior ranks, and it's almost like, you know, you, I was ranked fourth in the world in the juniors, won the world junior relay. You know, you're a good athlete. Then suddenly you go to the seniors, you're racing Lynn for Christie and John yeah. Regis. Like, Next level shit. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. So what the fuck's this yeah. about? So, so to me, you know, you go back to ground zero, you know, and a big bump, you know, and it was tough because, you know, you're thinking, am I doing the right thing? Am I, am I going to make it? And then suddenly Colin, the olive brands, I've moved up to 400 meters, bang. But I, I didn't, Colin didn't coach me for the 400 meters. Right. This is, you know, not not everyone sort of knows it. They think that when I went into Colin's group that he coached me. He for coached four, for the 100 and 200, didn't he? he? Co yeah. yeah. So he coached me for the 1 and 200 metres, right? Not thinking about I'm a 400 metre. Right? He didn't never thought, oh, yeah. I'm going to coach you for 400. Not That didn't go into his head. It was 1 and 2. And it didn't go into my head. It was when I did a British league in Cardiff, right? This is a mad story. I did a British league in Cardiff. And there's a guy called Adrian Thomas. He said, Jamie, if you run a really good relay leg today, we'll consider taking you to the European Championships, right? For in the in the four by four relay and the four hundred. And this was about a month before the Euros. I looked at him and went, What? And <laughs> people don't get this, but the a British League champ like race is it's got four people in the stands watching yeah. it's not like a you know grand prix when and the millions of people running it was nobody there nobody watching i ran this four by four i hurtled around the track i ran a 45 flat relay split where they he timed yeah. the people timed it and everyone was like shit it's like, quick that's quick and he said i'll consider you it i consider it and i knew it was uber quick right they didn't pick me but they picked me for the British under-23s race in Narbonne in France. French, uh, the French were there, Italians, Germans. Um, it was like eight different countries. I'm in lane five. Um, and the gun goes 43 degrees. It was boiling that day. And I'm a 200-meter runner. Never really run the 400 properly before. I did a few races, but yeah. I run a 400-meter run. I go around the first bend. I'm going down the back street, and I'm going. I go past the Italian, past it, you know, past the German. Past. By the time I got to 200 meters, I couldn't see anyone. I'd gone past you everyone. That's them. how <laughs> I smoked everyone, right? Because I'm a 200 meter yeah. runner. Right? So I'm running around the second turn, going, "Shit, what the? What's going on here, right?" I come up the home straight and I'm looking left and right and well, where is everyone? Like, you know, like you see, you know when you see people in the semi-final slowing like off? like cruise control. I'm cruising, coming up the home straight going, well, what's going on? I cross the line. The time doesn't come up. I'm like, shit. Anyway, half hour later, the time went on the scoreboard, 45-4-0, broke the Welsh record Amazing. in that first race. Um, then I ran a relay and ran 44-3 relay oh, wow. split, right? Went home, phoned up Colin, shit, Col, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. He was like, what the, you know. <laughs> you know. Anyway, I, the next week, I didn't get picked for the Euros, but then um, there was a race in Gateshead, which was massive in the UK back then. Gateshead was always was the a one, big yeah. race. You may remember them, you know, when you were younger. 
And I and Roger Blatt, Mark Richardson, you and Thomas, all of them in the relay. I came second. I beat Roger. In, and Roger just won the European Champions. He was the main man. At the he was the main yeah. man. The house, housewife's favourite. Everyone loved Roger. Blue Eyed Boy. Everyone. <laughs> and I beat him in my first race. And then in the relay, I beat. I I was got got the relay baton about thirty meters behind a, a guy called Brian Whittle, who was a really famous four hundred meter uh, uh, relay specialist. Won medals in relays. Ham, hammered him. Made him look like a boy. Do you know what I mean? Like I feel, <laughs> I feel bad now, even to this day. I just, yeah, hope, yeah. I just hope. Like in fact, Brian, you were a boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you might yeah, see that he's like a really famous Scottish guy now. He's empowering government up in yeah. Scotland. So I'm hoping he listens. And you were a boy. <laughs> <laughs> Love I, it. I schooled him. Yeah. Proper school. Anyway. Because I had the blonde dreadlocks <laughs> overnight. That one race, bang, famous. Like not. Uber, for, not like a lot Colin Limford, but everyone, wow, who's this? The rest is history. A year later, got an Olympic silver medal. Wow. Like it, it just went from nothing, but it, it came from, and then obviously, because I ran fast over four, Colin and me reassessed my training, going, hang on, we're coaching you for the wrong stuff. So, Colin, the following year, oh my God, I thought year one was hard training, year two, I then, it's, to I, yeah, I ended up moving up to doing 400 meter running. Training and kill me. That's Absolutely next. Oh, it's so tough, isn't it? Even now, I get like like thinking of it. It just scares me. Like you know, it's just horrible. It's horrible. mad, isn't it? Really. Mm. Uh, do you know when you would, would go from being a being a young kid, as you say, then competing against men, as you like? Mm. What was the actual? What was that like for you? Because obviously, you'd have been the top dog in yeah. in terms of you know running against the the younger younger yeah, people, yeah. if you like, then competing against men. Did that? set you back mentally saying did you have doubts saying or oh, am i good enough or am i not good enough yeah that 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 at that point it's you suddenly go oh, shit i'm i'm in not in trouble here but it's like oh this you know you you think you think you know when you're 17 18 19 you think you're the man right yeah. you, know, you 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 know i was on the rostrum in a world junior championships america was second you know you you're walking around the village thinking yeah. you you know everything's you know you're, you're the man like you know yeah look at me dreadlocks thinking i yeah. was all last pointing at people from italy you oh know, yeah <laughs> you know think i was special you yeah. know me and darren darren campbell was like my teammate and you know we'd sh- we used to share rooms together so like crazy <laughs> yeah, i'm not, not going to talk about that but but yeah crazy stuff and um so then when you then go into the seniors and you get your butt kicked each week and i remember a race I, it was in the heat of the British uh, Championships, and I was in lane one. And John Regis, um, Johnny Two Chess, as he's called in the industry, because he was massive, was in lane two. So the gun goes, and I'm running around the first curve like that. And I come into the home straight, and John's next to me. So I'm going, okay, I must be in first, second place. Yeah, yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Thirty meters from the finishing line, John Regis puts a little spurt in because he's just jogging. And I look like that, and I suddenly realise that me and John are seventh and eighth. Oh shit! And then he put a spurt in to win because he could, and then suddenly I, I, I must have come sick for something like that. Got, I went home. I'm going back in the car with my dad. Your dad, my dad's going, "What were you doing, like?" And I was going, "Well, I thought I was coming second, like, you know." And I went home. So I remember that really upset me just to go up to the British champs and go out in the heats and yeah. And at that point, you think, "Shit, am I going to make it? Have I got it? Have I got what it takes?" And, you know, and that's where, you know, Colin came along and, and the rest is history sort of thing, really. You know, it's funny how, how something just happens, a little spark happens. And obviously Colin could see from where he was sat, you know, for yeah. him to even ask me, he saw that I had the talent. Yeah. And he saw that I was committed when he saw me down the stadium, you know. He he wouldn't have just, he didn't just offer it just for, to anyone. He was like, no, I can see you've got something. And, yeah. And, um, yeah, and I... I owe him big time, really. I know. Yeah. He keeps telling me that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, with the ath- as an athlete, and you know, when you want to compete, and you're, you know, you pick up those injuries and stuff. Mm. How how mentally draining and challenging is that for you? How did you find it when you would pick up these niggles or injuries, and you're trying to get going again? Yeah, that's 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 a tough one. I was I was very lucky that. I only I only really had two injuries in the, the whole of my career. And that, you know, I'd pull my hamstring, you know, it mm. was nothing like didn't put my blow my Achilles or anything. Yeah. Like that. So I was never out for any long period of time. And I, you know, I, from 96 then to 2003, 
I think I won pretty much a, a medal most years. Yeah. You know? So I was w- one of the very fortunate athletes that every year I'd be in the relay worst case scenario. Yeah. You know, and, we, and because we had such a powerful relay, we'd get a medal. So I was, I was always sort of scraping into things. You know, some years were obviously a lot better than others, and you know. But I, I, you know, when I compare myself to all the other athletes who I used to compete against, you and Thomas would always get injured. Mark Richardson was injured. Roger Black got injured. You know, I was one of the lucky few who right, managed yeah. to keep unscathed. And I, I, and I don't know why that was because, you know, it's not the race in the 400 metres, which is hard. It's a training to race. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah. It's crazy, crazy stuff. It's f- Do you know, if you were, if you were competing today, mm. I've um, touched on this previously before if you if you were competing today and you had one of the male athletes then start competing in a females competition oh. you know uh, um, you know transgender w- um would you speak up on behalf of the female athletes because what i'm seeing mm. I, I don't think there's many people actually talking about or sticking up for yeah. for that kind of like industry or that industry and people at the top who are setting these rules, why has nothing been put in place previously? Yeah, I, I, I think it's ridiculous, really, because I, I just think it's totally unfair. Um, you know, it, you, you see Sharon Davis, the, the former swimmer, speaking Yeah, she's doing amazing it. work. Yeah, yeah, she's doing some amazing work. You know, it's this one swimmer who's like six foot two, used to be a man, and now is, you know, winning everything. Yeah. And I, I, think, I think what's going drastically wrong here is... The people who are making those decisions, I don't think have been former athletes, yeah. first and foremost. Yeah. Right? That's the first thing. They're government people who just don't really get sport. And they've made big brass decisions without the without thinking of the repercussions of what that really means. I mean, the record books in swimming have changed now just because of, you know, a nonsensical thought process. To me... There needs to be a space for those um, for those athletes. There needs to be a, a third space. Yeah. The men compete, the women compete, and then a third option where you know if this you know that that person who was a man and now is, is is said to be a woman, well, they're still six foot two and yeah. they've still got giant hands yeah. and big feet, which wouldn't have happened unless they were a man in the first place, generally. Yeah. And and we don't really know the science between how much testosterone they, they, they had helped them in their informative years to be the person they are now. Mm. So it's 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 it just to me seems nonsensical. And I do feel if a person does want to compete, will compete in another Compete in another space. Yeah. Don't compete in that space because surely you must know that that's not fair. And and I think what's going to come out of the woodwork now if they don't tackle it fairly quickly, you're going to get a lot of uh, men out there going, hang on a sec, mm. I'm a decent athlete here. There's a way in for it. There's a yeah. way in because people are crazy out there. People will do crazy things to to earn a living. Yeah. You know, in this day and age, especially with the YouTubers and whatnot. And I can see people going, you know what? I'm not really happy in my life being a bloke anyway. Not really happy. Oh, I could win a few million over you. I've ran, I've ran, I've ran 10 5 for the 100 meters. Yeah. Mm, let me just let's sh- give her a go. Let's, yeah. let's, have, let's have a pop light, you know? And, you know, I, I, I I I just don't think the people have set it up right. I just I I just think it's just been very brash. I think, you know, the the whole world and society is just is that we're going down the pan like you know? yeah. But do, do you know with especially in athletics, um, as you say, you know, the person who is now was born a male and then gone into the women's event. I don't think, you know, he's not top five or six in the world. You know, you're talking, he's probably not even the top hundred in that yeah, event. Yeah. So then to change, but surely that would be common sense to, even if you haven't been an athlete or not, you would understand that men are bought, they're stronger than women. Yeah. Yeah. You know? It, yeah. It, it, it is just common sense. And for some reason, I don't know, you know, I just think society is, everyone's just become very afraid. Mm. Every The society has gone, Oh, we've we need to be PC now. We need to be seen to do the right thing. I mean, I was I was in the cinema the other day watching a movie or the other month watching a movie, and you had the you know you'd have the gay guy in it, you'd have the transgender person in it, you'd yeah. have the, per- the 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 real 
the butch guy in it. Then you'd have the female in it. And and, and there was all this crossover. And then you'd see the, 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 these two women kissing. Then you'd see the two blokes. And then... And just kind of like Kate and, and, Kate I, was, and, and I was just watching it going, oh, this is shit. Like, and I was just thinking, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not <laughs> anti anything, right? My yeah. son's game. We'll, we can, I'm happy to talk about that, but like, but don't just chuck it in for chucking it in sake, sake because, yeah. because somebody needs to tick a box. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and I'm thinking this is, this is Hollywood now doing a box ticking exercise to go, Oh, look, Look, we you know, it was one of the Marvel movies. Yeah. And I'm going, oh, you've gone and messed you it up. It. Yeah. 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 You, yeah. You fucked it up. Yeah. yeah. And I'm just going, you're just doing it because you think that that's what needs to be seen. And look what we're doing. I'm thinking, no, it, it, it needs it. If it needs to be in there, it needs to be in there because it's a natural cause and effect rather than pushing an issue. Yeah. And I think that's what's coming out in the world now. And I think, you know, the transgender, the this or that, I just think it's all going crazy. I mean, you know, you've got the Kardashians and Bruce Jenner and, you know, you know, you've got um, 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 Kylie Jenner and all this stuff, you know, used to compete with Daley Thompson and this and that. And, you know, they're an uber wealthy family. And I... I you know, I could, I could, you know, the, the stuff which I see on TV now, you know, we were, we were discussing this earlier on. I, you know, I was watching, I was watching <laughs> something like you could get, I could talk about this all day. It's this one kid, right? And we'll go, I'm just going to go down this road and we can come back. But <laughs> it's this one guy, he's on YouTube and he's got millions of followers and he used to be, um, oh, he still is, he's a violinist. And I can't remember, he's something, some avocado or something his name is. He used to be a really slim guy. And all he does on YouTube is just eat and eat and eat. And now he's most probably about 25, 30 stone, maybe over that. And he's become famous by eating a load of stuff on YouTube and just going and gorging, like crazy gorging. And they're all going down his face. And he's being silly as he's doing it. He's got millions of followers and he's made millions and people are watching him. Yeah, watching that And he's shit. gonna have a cardiac arrest in the next five, 10 years. He's yeah. definitely gonna kill himself. Uh, unless he's then gonna do a video where he goes back slim and fit again. He's gone, oh, look at mm. that. And he's got millions in the bank. And he's been uber clever. But to me, it's just it's just a joke. To me, it's not funny. And you've got all these kids watching it. I mean, that, that YouTuber who's gone into boxing now, it's farcical. Yeah. Are we really a nation of watching farcical stuff like this when we all know he's a shit boxer? <laughs> we all know it, don't we? Yeah. But, and he's fighting every, he's, you know, you see the people he's boxing, they're tapping him just to, because they're all getting a big payday. I'm like, Do you know what? I think it just takes away from the sport because boxing is an amazing sport. Oh, I love yeah. watching it. and. They're dedicated athletes who put their lives on the line when they go into that yeah. ring, and it's kind of like, well, when they're setting this up, it's it's, oh, it's just fucking I, foolish, I, really. I, but oh, I hate it. do you think that? I know you mentioned there with with Hollywood and the Marvel stuff and and so on. Do you think that kids are actually being exposed to too much too soon these days? Yeah. Because of course, with the system that is put in place for many many years, is that they like to the system and the governments, et cetera, like to get kids into school so much so they can program them a certain way. Yeah. Do you think that's why there's, there's so much being shown in terms of like with the transgender and so on, what you've just mentioned about the Marvel um, movie that you watched, do you think that they're putting that out there to actually, is it is it weakening society on purpose or what do you think? That's a good question. I I don't really know the answer to what the, why they're ultimately doing it. All I know is just creating a lot of confusion. Imagine in the next 20 years time, like my children and then my children's children with the society going the yeah. way it is and not seeing it for the through real eyes. Imagine what, what, what it's going to be like in mm. 20, 30 years time yeah. if this is becoming the norm. It's going to be a mess. It, it, do you know what? It's going to be. And I think, you know, we keep speaking about, well, for a little while we were speaking about, right, let's get women equal rights and same pay as mm. men and this and that. And there was so much hard work put in, put in place. So we get to a certain level and then yeah. all of a sudden I feel like we've gone the other way. Yeah. And we're now saying men can have periods, men can have this, men can have that. And if fucking infuriates yeah, me yeah. too much um, no a guy can't have a period and no a guy can't get pregnant i think we're in a mad world where we actually have to state these things whereas before it'd be like 
What are you on about? Why are you doing? Yeah, you can, you can, like my, I, can you imagine, like my mum and dad are still here, like my mum's 85, my dad's 82. My mum and dad must be looking at society going, what the hell yeah. is going on? And I think, I think that, you know, okay, my mum lived it and my dad lived through a war. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> horrific. But I think the people who lived from maybe the 50s mm. through to the period maybe to now, and they just come into the end of the sort of, you know, maybe the next 10, 20 years they'll live for sort of, I think they may have had the best period in life. <laughs> yeah. Because I just think I, I wouldn't, like I've got a grandson, you know, and I, I worry about what, he's going to have to go through in yeah. life and in school. I mean, I don't agree with hitting kids and smacking and this and that, but I equally don't agree with it being so soft mm. because, you know, I all I regularly hear is, you know, I, I I used to go to schools five, ten years ago, I used to be in schools as Jane Bolsey athlete or whatever, and you should hear the kids speaking mm. to the teachers. It's I'm madness. like, I'm looking around going, Hang on, who's the teacher? Yeah. Where's the respect gone? It's gone respect is completely gone. And if those kids are being so unruly and then you've got all this gender stuff and this and that, they, they're just going to be confused. And then they're exposed to this avocado thing, this guy this guy who's like yeah. 25 stone thinking that's a way to earn loads of money. I'm going, oh, no. And you've got athletes out there. We discussed this earlier. You've got athletes out there like Dina Asher-Smith, who's an amazing athlete, the best sprinter we've ever had in this country, won numerous world sort of European medal standard. She could walk down the street and nobody knows who she yeah. is. Nobody even cares. It's gone the other way, it's hasn't it? It's gone the other way. They, they, these kids now want to watch the YouTuber who's being a dick. Yeah. And I'm going, really? Is that exciting you? Is that what gets you up in the morning? Oh, I want to be like that, you know, that... It hurts me, man. I just feel like, yeah, I feel like we don't talk about topics that are really important to society mm. and we just concentrate on all the other shit. Yeah. And, and society and social media is so fucking toxic. Yeah, yeah. It's well, off it, the it, chart. Well, it's funny. I went, I went, like, I'm on I, I'm on Instagram. Um, I'm, I've got a, um, a Twitter page. I don't really use it. And I'm on Facebook. You know, when I put something on Insta, yeah. it goes onto my Facebook. So really, I'm just on Insta, if that makes sense. And I was away in Turkey for a week. I've just come back a couple of days ago. And I weren't really on my Instagram at all. I, I did a couple of posts whilst yeah. I was there, but I didn't look at anyone else's, if that makes sense. I yeah, was just posting. Just posting, got off there. And I and I got back, and you naturally go back into the routine. You were, and I went back onto my thing. And I, I'm scrolling. <laughs> I find it funny. I'm scrolling through my feed, and I'm actually going, oh, God, that's really shit. Yeah. That's rubbish. Why am I interested in watching what this person's doing? What am I doing? You know, like, it's it's a load of crap. Most of it's shit. It's a load of crap. I'm going, it's self-promotion crap. I don't want to know, really, what you're doing. And, and and maybe people don't want to know what I'm doing. Like, you know, I get it. And that's I'm, fine, yeah. Yeah, I'm not saying, oh, no, all watch me, but I don't want to watch you. Like, I don't want to get that, you know, mix my words here. But but it does, it did, that week made me go, this is shit. Yeah. And and Cheryl, my partner, she's really not on this. She didn't care about it. She lives in the real world, you know. And, I, and, and you know, she does yoga and she meditates and she's really... She's always she's present. Really present. And that's a good word to use is present. And and I'm going, nah, that woman's right. Yeah. It's, it's a load of crap. Like, and, and, and you know, I want to go... And I know my son, my oldest son, is not really on there. And, you know, it's... it's, it's, it's life's better without it. Life's totally better without it. Totally. Totally. You know, with... Um... You know, obviously, we talked about your sons earlier mm. and you being an ex-athlete. Um, you were telling me an unbelievable story earlier about when your son came out. Yeah. And I want you to share it for the viewers. Because yeah. honestly, I was fu I was like, wow, it's like <laughs> fucking one of the best stories I've ever heard. <laughs> so so Morgan, my youngest, is, is all in all out gay. I've known... I've always thought he was gay way before he came out. I mean, I'll give you, I'll give you the. Oh, from yeah, sorry to interrupt you. With you being a parent mm. and your son is gay, and you mentioned that you, um, you mentioned earlier that he, you knew from a very early age. Mm. Do you think a child is born that way, or do you think it's um, maybe a learned learn behavior, or what? Do you, what do you I, feel I, about that? I believe he's born that way. Yeah. 
I, I, that's my personal opinion. I, I 100% think he was born that way. Um, and and the reasons, I'll give certain anecdotes of certain behavioural things when he was younger. I mean, <laughs> he he used to love women's clothes when he was a real young kid. Yeah. Like, and he used to like the bright pinks and whatnot or whatever. So very, very effeminate even then. And it was with my ex-partner. It was the Eurovision Song Contest. I think for the start off, he loves that. So you've got to be a bit <laughs> like, you've got to be at that side of the fence if you're really loving that from when you're a kid. And, uh, you know, anyway, <laughs> this one particularly, he was about six, only young. He had a pink pillowcase cover taken off the pillow and he had it on his hair. So he had it wrapped around it. So it was like long hair. Yeah. And he's watching it. And he's going like that, watching the event, swaying it and loving it. And I looked at my ex partner, I went, <laughs> and we, we both went, is he, he's gay, isn't he? Like, you know what I mean? Because <laughs> he was just, he just, he just loved it, you know what I mm. mean? And um, so I always thought, you know, he had that effeminate side. And then when he got to 11, 12, 13, 14, I could see he went through a little bit of a transition. And me and his ex-partner, we split up, so it was a bit of a tough time for him. But he went through a transition where, and he went to a new school, which was really tough. And I think at that point, I think he knew he was gay when he was 10, 11, 12. Yeah. I think he knew. Obviously, me and him never spoke about it because he's very young. And, and you know, I was I would always speak about it if he if ever mentioned anything. But I think he went through a tough time. So I was always there for him to know if there's anything yeah. on the chat about whatever, whatever. But anyway, but he didn't. But he, um, it was when he, <laughs> he was, it was when he was sixteen. He's nineteen now, um, fifteen and a half, not sixteen, that sort of age. He goes to me, um, Dad, I'm going out tonight. I said, Oh yeah, yeah, where are you going? I'm going to Cardiff, and we were, we were at my mum and dad's at that that day. And he said, Oh, Dad, have you got a bag I could use? I go, I go, Yeah, yeah, you know the back, the the, the backpack you got, the duffel bag sort of thing. Yeah, yeah, can I use it? Yeah, no problem. And he had sort of a pair of jeans, trainers, a sweatshirt. You know, general clothes, and if you want to brand it that. So I run him off at half seven at night to this to to Cardiff Centre, and I'm I pull up by the Motor Point Arena, um, but on the road where they got John Lewis, and I'm on the side here, right next to these apartments. And I said, "Son, I I said, what time's it finished?" He said, oh, at "Quarter past ten. I'll be out. Okay, okay, I'll be here at quarter past ten. I'll meet you right here. Yeah, not a problem, Dad." He goes off, duffel bag jeans, swept top, trainers. I pull up at 10 past 10. God, they really, you know, being <laughs> a responsible dad, you know, not late. And I'm looking on my phone, Marvel. I mentioned Marvel earlier on. I love Marvel movies. So I'm watching Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. on my mobile phone. I got my phone like this and I'm looking at Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. And I, I text him. I said, oh, son, just to let you know, I've arrived early, I'm here. Uh, he responds pretty quickly saying, yes, dad, I'll be out shortly. So I go back to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. and I'm watching the telly. And you know you get submerged in, yeah. into something. So the time was going. So quarter past 10 went, 25, uh, 20 past 10 went, 25 past 10. So I've been, he's 10 minutes late now as far as I'm concerned. So I text him and I said, <laughs> hey, son, where are you? He said, oh, sorry, Dad, I'm on my way. 25 past 10. No problems. Back to Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. <laughs> Half 10, um, 10.35. 10.40, I'm like, you're taking them piss, mate. Like, yeah, yeah. So I text him. I said, son, you're having a laugh. You need to come now. Like He said, sorry, dad. I am literally on my way. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I look at Agent of Shield on my phone and I look up and I'm 100 metres away from the traffic lights where he needs to cross over yeah. to, to, and then come down to where I was parked. And I look up like that and I see my son with his hair up, makeup on, lipstick, a Freddie Mercury sort of studded <laughs> jacket, a mesh top, hot pants, tights and long boots with heels on. And I went, fuck <laughs> Like, I'm screaming, like screaming in the car, in the car. <laughs> like what the you know like and I'm just staring going oh my god he crosses over the road like Naomi Campbell <laughs> he looked like an uber supermodel right and he's crossing over here swishing he crosses over the road and all I'm doing is going Fah! like constantly right and he's coming down the road and he's walking towards me like that mincing down the road but he looks amazing 
And I'm like in this transition of what the hell am I seeing? But also at the same time, which is weird, I was going, wow, I was blown away with what I was seeing. I weren't annoyed. I weren't a thing. I was just like, who the hell is that? Wow. Like, <laughs> like, forget Julian Cleary or Eddie Izzard. This guy's on a next level. Do you mean it? Beautiful. Yeah. Like model. Opens a car door, sits next to me, goes, all right, Dad, the deepest voice <laughs> in the world. I went, all right, son. I said, do you have a good night? He said, yeah, Dad, I had a really good night, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, and I'm just going, oh, yeah, so, yeah, what's going on? Like, he went, yeah, you know, it's just great. And I, I didn't know what to say because I all ready knew yeah. it wasn't a shock it was a shock that he was dressed up like you know Eddie Izzard sort yeah. of thing it was a shock that he was you know dressed up and had all this makeup on so I was like a bit like taken back because I'd never seen it before but equally at the same time I just had a little wry smile because I went you know good on you because yeah, yeah. you're being the person who you want to be and you know that's the only important thing to me is you know if that's who you are I will support it I will not tell you, you why are you doing son? You okay? Get inside, you know. What's that gonna do? Yeah, All that's exactly. gonna do is smother him. Mm. How can I ever be that person when my mum and dad adopted me, gave me that opportunity? When Colin Jackson gave me an opportunity, what am I gonna do? Son, take that makeup off, get inside, you look at disgrace. No. He looks amazing. Yeah. I love him. I want you to be that person. And you know what? From that day, he's always been out there and always happy anyway, but now... Did he take it up a few notches oh, after that? <laughs> ne ne next, next notch, next notch. You know what I mean? I, I, like, so I was like, wow. So this is to show you how amazing this kid is, right? And I'm so proud. He's 16. He goes to Bridge End College. So Bridge End isn't like very cosmopolitan, right? No. It's not like Cardiff and it's certainly not like London or Manchester. So, he, so I... I um, we, Go out from the Vale, we're driving down the road. He's got this Gucci bag, like bright Gucci, all different. You know, it's a pretty cool bag, actually. And he's got his hair braided. It's short on the side. And he's got it up. And he opens this bag and he opens this and he pulls out a makeup bag bigger than any woman's makeup bag. Like, he, like he's 16, so he didn't really know about makeup. So, <laughs> well, he does, actually. But, you know, he, he had, you know, all the bits in there. So he, he puts down the sun visor and he starts putting on lipstick and foundation and, and I'm looking and I'm driving going, shit. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Like, he's going to bridge end. He's going to get beaten up. Somebody's going to punch him in the were face. You, were, you, were you more concerned or were you actually, oh, my God, as in, like, my son's putting makeup on or were you actually thinking from a I, I, safety point of view? 90% safety. Yeah. 10%, oh, shit. Shit, like, like yeah. shocked. Yeah, yeah, a bit like, because I'd seen it before and I knew he was experimenting at that point. So I was a little bit, you know, if I'm honest, a little bit like, oh, oh I'm not, I'm not it's used to this. It's new for you. Yeah, it's new, new for me. I'm, un I'm uncomfortable because I was thinking, I don't know how to handle this. This is yeah. something new to me. And, you know, it's a little bit in your head. Oh, God, people know he's my son and all that. It was, a, you know, maybe 1% of, well, what what are people going to say and, and blah, blah, blah. But that was 1%. And, and I thought, fuck everyone else. Sorry yeah, to yeah. use, you know, the language. But I just thought, no, this is between me and my son. And I will, I will ease my son. You'll protect him at all I costs, will protect yeah. my son. I will protect all my family. You know what I mean? So I was going, if that's who he wants to be, that's who he is. It's not, I, it's, I wouldn't do that. And it's something I wouldn't be comfortable about doing, but it's what he wants to do. So he gets out at nine o'clock in the morning, five to nine. And I'm thinking, shit, he's, you know, I hope he doesn't get beaten up today. Like, and, uh, he goes into the college a week before that moment. He's at the Mardi Gras in Cardiff and he's on stage hula hoop and he can hula hoop really good. Like, you know, if he came in here now and started, we'd be, be clapping and we'd be like, Woo! you know, whooping him and we'd be, you'd be uber impressed, right? Because he's brilliant at it. And he could be hula hooping, talking to you, not even worrying, like talking. Just like, like you know, natural. Yeah, natural. Just, you know, over the neck and all that stuff. At, at one point, he was doing it with the hair. Oh, my God. In in the hair, like, you know, but I'm like, how are you doing That's that? That's magic. Yeah, 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 crazy stuff, right? So he's doing that on stage. So he comes out at four o'clock Big smile on his face, and I'm thinking, okay, he's, he's had a good day. Guess in the car. I said, how did it go today, Dad? He goes, oh, Dad, I'm famous. I went, what do you mean you're famous? He said, you know that Mardi Gras thing I did last week? Yeah. He said, most of the college just so happened to be there. So everyone went, you're that kid, you're that kid. 
And this is when I thought to myself, you got, you are on the next level to my son. The next day, I drive into college. He's got that same Gucci bag in front of him. We get to the place where he started putting the makeup on, and he go and I go, and he didn't put it on. And we get a bit further, and I'm looking at the bag, and I'm looking at him as I'm driving. I said, "Oh, son, you're not going to put the makeup on today, are you?" And he went, "Dad, he sh- I, he said I showed everyone who I was yesterday. I don't need to show anyone anymore." That's amazing. And I was like, "He's 16," and I'm thinking, "Where has that maturity mm. and acceptance and come from?" You know, and I, you know, I'd like to think that you know I've played a good part and his mother's played a good part and my gra- and his grandparents you know we've he's had a very solid supportive environment but I just he's just so impressive but now he's in London he's a dancer and he's in uni and living like living the living life, the he life wants to, yeah. living the life he wants to live and I'm just so proud of him you know that's amazing I think that's obviously testament to you and your family to uh, provide mm-hmm. that like you know safety net if you like around him and um, you know for allowing him to be that way because mm-hmm. most parents these days they kind of live their dreams through their children don't yeah. they especially in the sporting world yeah yeah and so the fact that you've done that well well yeah do I, you know what that fucking story when you crossed i, I oh, just got visions of it like it's, I, it's pitch black and you just see oh, that <laughs> honestly it was like like i i so i can see it so clearly it, it's funny enough i chatted to him the other the other week um about this and he said we talked about it because we've never spoken about it right and I was up in London. He's living in a great apartment in London, and um, and he uh, we chatted about it. And he said, "I said, oh, that day, you know." I, I said, "You know, I tell lots of people that story, right?" Yeah. And he laughed, and we laughed. Like he said, "You know, after that, Dad, when I went home, he said, you know, I I, I got upset,' and I went, "Oh, bless him." What? And I went, "What? Like you know, he never told me and this recently. This only like a month ago." And I went, "He said, yeah, I, got, I was crying when I got back home, and and I went." And I I was hurting when he was telling me, and he just said, because I was really scared. I bet he was, yeah. yeah. And I'd never thought of that, because my reaction to when I saw it, except the back through yeah. the, through the pin. <laughs> so when I thought he, you had Tourette's. Yeah, <laughs> when, when he actually sat in the car, I was cool. Yeah. I wasn't going, what are you doing? I was cool. And, and I think he was nervous, so I might not be, you know. But I'm, I, no, you know, like... I've always been there, supported him on every level, and and my oldest son Jay. I've always been there, you know. G- g- give them the tools and the opportunity to, to, for them to enjoy their lives, whatever that is, and whatever they're going to be. And you know, I I know there's a lot of parents out there, and there may be some people listening to this program who who may have children who are who are gay or whatever. And you know, th- those. We're living our lives. Let the others live theirs. Like yeah. Whoever they are, you know, you've got a son or a daughter or this or that, you know, just help them. Like, I, I you know, let's reach back and help others, pull other people up. And if if, if we can help, you know, like Colin helped me and my mum and dad have helped me, if, if I can help my son to feel more comfortable in the family environment, which then gives him that comfort to know that I've got his back, which then gives him the confidence to be the person he wants to be, which then he excels in that yeah. world great no it's amazing no i do you know what i think we should finish on that point i love no i loved having you on <laughs> amazing athlete amazing Cheers. person so yeah thank you so much and i always ask the guests before we finish mm. what's the best bit of advice you've ever been given and what's the best advice you'd give someone else <sighs> oh it's got you caught me off guard there um best advice i've ever been given um always be yourself be true to yourself so that's, you know, I've been given that advice by several people over the years. Just be true. So the, the the late John Humphreys um, 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 said to me, um, just be, always be yourself, Jamie. Never change. And and, and that's what's going to make you excel. And I think that's, that's, that's really important. Um, and then what was the one? So always... What's, what's the best the, advice you... What, what advice would you give someone else yeah so it's the same advice it's just you know be just be yourself like why why don't conform to what people expect you to be don't be unruly for unruly sake yeah, oh yeah. yeah let me just be like oh okay he said that advice i'm gonna do this now no just be your true self because ultimately we're not we're not going to be around forever yeah so why fake it you know be you know and i i'd like to think i'm very authentic and and that's why I get on with most people because I'm not hiding anything. 
and that you can go out into the world not feeling oh what's this person going to think or say and yeah I, you know I can live a happy life because of that no amazing thank you so much for Pleasure. joining me I've enjoyed it really Ta good chat <laughs> top man thank you cheers great really